I do wish to uh, pay recognition uh, and acknowledgement to the African uh, Research Committee. If it were not for them, we would not be here. So Professor Jackson and I traveled a whole heaps of miles coming from the Midwest, a place called the Windy City that's supposed to be in Chicago and the great prayer state of Illinois. And uh, we are more than grateful to be here to try and render service to you if we can. So I'm going to try and fulfill the assignment as given. I'm a very obedient person when it comes to that. It says a biographical sketch, a background on Professor John G. Jackson. Uh, and Professor is one who teaches uh, teachers different from a professor. And we are all professors because we profess something. Uh, John G. Jackson was born April 1, 1907 in Aiken, South Carolina. During his student days, he did researching and writing articles about Afro-American life. He wrote for Negro World in 1925 and was a regular contributor to the truth seeker between 1930 and 1955. In 1932, he became an associate director of the Blyden Society, then under the leadership of Dr. Willis N. Huggins. The most talented student to come out of the group was John Henry Clark. And if I might pause just a wee bit, when we say John Henry Clark, we sometimes should stop with silence to give recognition and acknowledgement because Brother Clark is one who deserves such. Right. Right. In 1934, Brother Jackson co-authored with Dr. Huggins a guide to study of African history. And in 1937, also with Dr. Huggins, Introduction to African Civilization, which they are in abundance over the table there in the rear. Professor Jackson has taught and lectured in the Black Studies Department of Newark College of Arts and Sciences, 1971 to 1973. A visiting professor at the City University of New York, 1973 to 1977 and a visiting professor at Northeastern Illinois University from 1977 to 1980. That's located in Chicago. And I heard the brother before me speak about the community university and in that building we housed something of such activity back some time ago, headed by the brother, late brother Bobby Wright, uh, which many of you know about or heard of. Okay. Uh, in addition, he was a regular lecturer in the Ingersoll Forum from 1930 to 1955 and at the Harlem Unitarian Church. His two recent works, Introduction to African Civilization, 1970, and Man, God, and Civilization, recently he published, or, co or authored that is, Christianity Before Christ, 1986. And the most recent thing, Black Reconstruction in South Carolina, Hubert Henry Harrison, the Black Socrates, and the Golden Ages of Africa. And the last publication is chapter two of a book in which the brother is now going to commence writing on in high gear with great deliberation for the next six or seven months after leaving your fair city of Oakland. And the title of the book will be on the history of the world, which as you might know if I may indulge upon your intelligence. The book uh, History of the World as has been written all before has never included Africa. And if you recall, John Henry Clark uh, Brother Jackson and others, Queen Mother Moore, and several persons of the African community tried to argue with the uh, with UNESCO of the United Nations to try and put Africa into history books. 
But somehow the brother's intelligence rolls to the surface and to the occasion to say, why argue with someone if we know what we are doing and they know not what they are doing, we will commence to do just that. So the brother has commenced to do that, and I hope we will all give recognition and acknowledgement to such if this is be the case. So it's many, many experiences uh, Brother Jackson and I have uh, uh, undergone, and we have enjoyed together. He's a very hard brother, but since he's from uh, Arkansas, the I mean, South Carolina, the Pasque State, and I'm from Red Stick, Louisiana, the Bayou country, I seem to sort of excel a little taste, maybe if I age alone. But uh, before I sit, uh, Brother Ben Yosef Yakanan and John Henry Clark gave me an assignment say, James, take care of John. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the disciples, I'm one of them, and he's the other one. And I just found out something about him. He's been a, a knighted bishop. I didn't know anything about him. So at any rate, without you know, further ado and enjoying all of the accolades that you have laid before me, I'm going to bring up the elder, and I will let him go from there. Brother John G. Jackson. Step over there, please. Now, since this is a church, I would address you as brothers and sisters. <laughs> Now, uh, I've got a lot of notes here, but uh, I uh, want to make just a short talk and let you people ask me some questions. I probably won't have answers to most of them, but uh, yeah, if I know the answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't, I'll tell you that I don't know. But uh, Cage uh, brought up uh, some of my misconduct in the past. Uh, in New York about 50 years ago, I was writing articles for a magazine called The Truth Seeker, and I was lecturing for an organization known as the Ingersoll Forum, named after a great American uh, statesman, Colonel Robert D. D. Ingersoll. And uh, the editor of The Truth Seeker was also a uh, chairman of the Ingersoll Forum, a man named Charles Smith from Arkansas. So Smith says, Jackson, would you like to be a bishop? I says, don't joke. He says, well, there's a new church out, and I think it's out in Denver, Colorado. The Supreme Pontiff of the Liberal Church of America will appoint anybody a bishop that'll send him in a donation of a dollar. So I thought the whole thing was a joke. So I handed Charlie Smith a dollar. I says, okay, send in my application. And lo and behold, I got a uh, document stating that I had been appointed a bishop of the Liberal Church of America and that I could get uh, liquid spirits at half price, <laughs> travel to reduce fares on railroad trains, and perform marriage ceremonies. Well, uh, I considered the whole thing a joke, and I said to Charlie Smith, uh, where will I be bishop? He says, well, you live in Harlem, you'll be the bishop of Harlem. So, of course, uh, I treated it as a joke, but I uh, lectured at places like uh, the YMCA and the Unitarian Church, and the joke caught on, and the people were introducing me as Bishop Jackson. Now, um, I, uh, back in 19... 38, I wrote a little pamphlet called Christianity Before Christ. And uh, last year, I had rewritten this stuff and got it into a book, and now it's a book on Christianity Before Christ. The right title for that book should have been The African Origin of Christianity. 
But uh, I realized that uh, if I gave it that title, uh, you probably, very few people would buy the book. Because I, well, a sad feature about black people today is that most of them are almost totally illiterate. They can't read anything anymore. Uh, television have robbed them of what little uh, literacy they had. So uh, if you, I just call it Christianity Before Christ in hopes that a few white intellectuals would read it. Would read it. And it worked out all right. Uh, the book came out uh, late in uh, 1985. It's been out just a little over a year now, and uh, I think the publisher sold over a thousand copies, so that's not bad for a serious book. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was teaching at the City University of uh, New York, uh, I was using two of my books as textbooks, uh, Introduction to African Civilizations and Man, God, and Civilization. So one of my students came and said, Professor Jackson, is there any money in writing? I said, why do you ask that question? He said, well, I figured if there was any money in writing, I would become a writer. I said, well, go wait, wait a minute, young man. I said, you, yeah, yeah. you were talking through it. I said, if you had a hat on, I'd say you were talking through it. I said, if you have musical ability, you become a musician. If you have uh, scholarly ability, you become a professor. If you have medical ability, you become a doctor. If you have legal uh, 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 ability, you become a lawyer. I says, now if you can write, you can become a writer. I says, but well, uh, knowing you only slightly, I have an idea that you couldn't write anything that anybody would want to read. <laughs> so one of the students got up and said, why do you take that attitude? I said, well, I've been teaching at this institution for quite a while now, and I asked all of my students to turn in a ten term paper, and I says, it's only 10 pages long, and they can't write 10 pages. They go clip pictures out of newspapers and put a picture on every other page, so I get about five pages of, uh, of text. I says, now you can't, fellas can't write 10 pages in a term paper, how are you going to write books? Uh, I will never mil uh, win a popularity contest because uh, I'm honest with my students and they don't appreciate that. I had a class at the uh, City University of New York where although it was in the college, I found out that most of my students were reading on the fourth grade reading level, a fourth grade reading level in college. And I frankly told them that most of them seem to have the brain capacity of a mentally retarded mule. <laughs> so one young lady got up and told me that she demanded an apology. And I said, young lady, I will not apologize for telling the truth. Now, uh, one of the reasons why you will listen to, to me tonight is because I'm not a member of the club. I, I, know, I think you might know what the club is. That's the academic racket club. Uh, and the way you work it is that uh, you start out and you go through law school. They call that elementary school. That's law school. Then that takes up eight years. Then you go four years of high school and then four years as an undergraduate student in college. And if you're studying for a profession, you do four more years of uh, uh, graduate work in a university. Now, that's not what happened to me. Uh, I was uh, not uh, I was not good in school. Uh, I was a student in a little school down in Aiken, South Carolina, called the Schofield School, established in 1868 by Martha Schofield. Uh, Old maid school mom from Quaker from Pennsylvania. And uh, I went to the Schofield School, and it was a good school. I mean, they, it, it, it was the best school in the state in Aiken, South Carolina, that colored people could go to. I don't know how good the white school was, but uh, yeah, it, they gave them more money, so it might have been a little better. But I went to the Schofield School for several years, 
And uh, I was a student there from during the First World War. I remember that I was a student in the Schofield School back during the years of 1915, 1916, 1917. Uh, this was the European War, and uh, President Thomas Woodrow Wilson decided that the United States should go over to Europe and save democracy. Wilson said he was going to make the world safe for democracy. Wilson was born in Virginia, and he couldn't even make Virginia safe for democracy, but he was going to make the world safe for democracy. So uh, he got into the war. But at any rate, I would be sitting in class, and since I was a, a fast reader, whatever the assignment was, I always read it way in advance, and I knew what was going to be covered. And therefore, while the teacher was telling the other students uh, uh, what the message was, I already had it. And I sat in the back of the class and read the newspapers about how the Germans and French were slaughtering up each other wholesale on the Western Front in France. And uh, some of the students went home and told their parents that they had to sit there and listen to the t teacher. And this little Jackson boy was sitting in the back of the room reading newspapers. So uh, yeah, the teacher went to the, uh, to the principal and told him what the complaint was. So the principal says, Miss So-and-so, does this Jackson boy uh, answer the right, when you ask him a question, does he give you the right answer? She says, yes, he jumps up and gives me the right answer, and then he sits down and starts reading the newspaper again. <laughs> he says, leave him alone. As long as he's getting the lesson, uh, don't bother him. Well, uh, I found out that uh, I got a bad press down there. Uh, I got up to the seventh grade, and my scholastic record was so good until the principal of the school came and said, Johnny, you're such a good scholar until we are going to skip you over the seventh grade and put you into the eighth grade. And I thanked him. A few days later, he comes in and he says, the parents of the children who are not being promoted over the seventh grade and they have staged stage of protest. And they say that we shove you over the seventh grade into the eighth. They're going to pull all that students out of the school. So we'll have to insist on you going through the seventh grade. So I went through the seventh grade and then went into the school and handed in my resignation. I said, I should have been finishing the eighth grade, but you wouldn't let me do it, so I quit. So uh, then I went to my father. He says, well, now that I uh, dropped out at the end of the seventh grade, where do I go now? My father says, we're going over to Augusta, Georgia. There's a a uh, lady over there who's a great educator, Miss Lucy Laney, the Haynes Institute. Says, you got through the seventh grade, and I'm going to go over there and tell Miss Laney to put you in her high school. So I went to Augusta and put in one year at the Haynes Institute High School. And then I uh, finished up the first year. And my mother told me, she says, boy, I don't think you're going to get a good education down here. I'm going to take you up to New York so that you can go to a good high school in New York and get yourself a good education. So my mother and myself came up to New York in 1922, and I got a job down in the Wall Street district. Uh, it didn't bring me any more money. I mean, the, everybody else in Wall Street was getting rich except me. But it was down in that section. So uh, I would go to Stuyvesant High School in the morning. That's one of the best high schools in the whole country. I got an education at Stuyvesant High School between 1922 and 26. That's better than you can get in the average college today. Because they had high, they had high standards back in those days. Now you can go through low school, high school, college, and university, get a PhD after your name and still be an idiot. <laughs> in those days, in those days, you couldn't do it. 
Now, uh, I've been asked to, uh, now I haven't finished the story yet. I graduated from high school. Then I got a job working as a red cap. Some of you people probably don't know what a red cap is because we don't have many railroads around today. But red caps were people who dressed up in a uniform with a red cap and they would carry bags to and from trains and railroad stations and try to live off the tips that the people give them. There's no salary to the job. You put on a uniform and work 10 hours a day and hope that you would make enough money to pay your rent and grocery bill. So I put in 10 hours a day red capping and then attended night classes at the City College of New York. And I was so sleepy when I went to classes until I slept through all the lectures. And they managed to stand my society for four years. And then they told me that since uh, I missed all the lectures and were giving all the wrong answers on the examination paper, that uh, if I didn't improve, uh, they were going to boot me out of the school. Well, I couldn't improve, so I dropped out. So then I decided that uh, since I couldn't stay in college, that I had to have an education, and I knew the right people. Uh, I knew a man named Mr. Arthur A. Schomburg, who was the curator of the Schomburg Library in New York. You, you all heard about it, that. And I would be sitting in there at the big round table and uh, educating myself through the 10,000 books in the Schomburg collection. And whenever I got stuck, Mr. Schomburg would come over and give me a helping hand. And sometimes as we sat there, J.A. Rogers would come in. You all know about J.A. Rogers. Rogers would come in and sit next to me. So I had teachers like Arthur A. Schomburg, J.A. Rogers, and Dr. Hubert Henry Harrison, uh, who uh, uh, is a black scholar that you probably never heard of. Uh, and the only reason you never heard of him was because he was black. If you, if you were a white man, they'd have monuments built to him all over the country. Now, uh, here's what I'm leading up to. When I was a boy down Lake in South Carolina, at Sunday school, I was taught that God created the white man as the superior race. And he, uh, uh, after the flood, when Noah was celebrating the, uh, the end of this great deluge, he got drunk and took off all of his clothes and doing the strip tease. And one of his sons named Ham thought that this was really funny and he started laughing. And God looked down from heaven and said, uh, I will not tolerate this disrespect for parents. So he turned Ham black and shipped him off to Africa. And he doomed Ham and all of his descendants to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for their more fortunate brothers. In other words, uh, Africa was of no importance in world history because it was settled by an accursed race. And I got this story in church. When I went to school, I got the same story. And then I would go to church and the preacher would get up and ask us to sing a hymn. Oh, Lord, ble bleach us out whiter than snow that we may enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then I say to myself, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> then they had him another one. You can have all the world, but just give me Jesus. And I began to have the idea that there was something wrong with this. I couldn't imagine that everybody else had a history, but only the African people didn't have one. And then I began to study uh, the theory of evolution. And the Bible, the way the Bible has been corrupted by white folks, you get the idea that the human race started out being white and that the superior type of human being is a white man. And uh, uh, the yellow people and the brown people and the red people, they are a little bit lower. But the black man is the low man on the totem pole. He's the, he's the nobody. So uh, I said to myself, I know there's something wrong with this. So I got up to Harlem and heard Dr. Harrison lecture. 
and heard J.A. E. Rogers give lectures, and I went and studied with Schomburg, and they began to tell me what to read and what, what to study. And then I found out that uh, the first human beings were not white folks, they were black people, because the human race started in Africa millions of years ago. And these black people were the first members of the human race. And some of them wandered into Europe and got bleached out white. And some of them wandered into Asia and got bleached out yellow. And some of them wandered into America and got bleached out red. But the original man was the black man. And then I found out another thing. That in these uh, early, uh, these people wrote their own histories. and. Uh, they, the Christians say that God is a oversized man. The image of God is a big man. These ancient people in Africa said that the first God was a woman. They said because in the uh, process of evolution, the female sex is the primary sex and it comes first. So the woman must have become before the man. And if uh, the first human being was made in the image of God, God must have been a woman. And there's a book out now by um, an author named Merlin Stone, When God Was a Woman. Now, uh, I began to study, and I found out that uh, you go back and study the, the ancient history of Egypt, and especially the religion of ancient Egypt, and they had a Bible. I have a good English translation of it in three volumes, three volumes in one, called the Theban Recension of the Book of the Dead. And in this, you take this Egyptian Bible and compare it with the King James Bible, which is popular among the Protestant denominations in the United States. And you study the Egyptian Bible and you study the Christian Bible. The Egyptian Bible goes back 10,000 years. The King James Bible only goes back about 300 years. Uh, the King James, I think it was about 1619. And then you study these two books and compare them. And you, found that, you find out that the Christians took the whole Christian Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament out of the Egyptian book of the dead. So that if you want to go to the source, don't go to King James. Go to ancient Egypt and you've got a Bible that's 10,000 years older than anything that these Christians have. Now, uh, I, uh, after studying this, I uh, decided to uh, do some research and writing. And uh, I, uh, after dropping out of college, I would work on a job in the day and go to the library and study at night. In those days, they kept the libraries open until 11 o'clock at night. So that if you couldn't go to school, you could go to the library. Nowadays, they close. sometimes the library closes early, so if you wait, you're not going there. I had the good fortune to be born before there was any radio and before there was any television, so I had to learn to read, write, and count. Today, with uh, uh, television and radio, you have students going through college, graduating with a degree, and then they can't even write their own name. There was a University of Iowa, a student who was a football player. He graduated with a BA, BA after his name. He was planning to be a professional football player. He had an accident and broke one of his feet. So he had to take a job as a parking lot attendant. And then when he signed the uh, job application, he misspelled his own name. This is what you have going on today. Now, uh, here's what I, I wanted to say. Uh, according to the Christian, to the King James Version of the Bible, uh, if you go to a, a Protestant church, you find a big Bible there. And in the back of it, they have the chronology of Archbishop Usher of the 16th century. 
an English, uh, I mean, an Irish archbishop of the 16th century. And he, he tells you how old the world is according to the King James Version of the Bible. And he tells you that God created the earth in the year 4004 B.C. <laughs> and I began to study the history of Africa, particularly the history of Ethiopia and Egypt. And I found out that the Egyptians built the great, the great pyramid over a thousand years before the earth was created. <laughs> and then I ran across another biblical scholar, uh, uh, the vice uh, chancellor, uh, uh, the, the Reverend Professor Lightfoot, vice chancellor of Cambridge University, and he improved on Usher. He says, God created the world in the year 4004 BC on September the 22nd. <laughs> it was either September or October, I don't remember, the, at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now I'm wondering what day of the week was it? <laughs> And if the world was created on this particular day, on this particular year, at 9 o'clock in the morning, what happened at 8 o'clock? <laughs> I mean, you, you, uh, you have all these unanswerable questions. So then I began to do research, and we were told that uh, yeah, this godlike white man, the first civilization in the world was that of the Greeks. They was a... Uh, uh, supposed to be the most intellectual white people that ever lived. And that uh, they created a great civilization and then passed it on to the Romans. And all the great civilizations were created by white folks. Uh, a short, back in 1934, an English historian named Arnold J. Toynbee wrote uh, a study in history, a history of the world in 12 volumes. Don't try, if you find the book in the library, don't try to read it. Because one of the hardest books to read is Karl Marx's Capital. And he was an even worse writer than Marx was. Uh, that's a record. Toyn B says there have been 21 civilizations in the world. So many were created by the white race, so many by the yellow race, so many by the brown race, so many by the red race. The black race has not created one civilization. None at all. We have done nothing. So uh, I was giving a lecture uh, in New York, and somebody says, well, didn't Toyn B know that the Egyptians were black people? I says, Toyn B says they were white people. You see, if you, uh, if you are a racist historian, uh, you don't have any regard for the facts at all. I visited West Africa in 1977, uh, Senegal. Then I went to Kenya. That used to be British East Africa. Then on up to Egypt, to, to Cairo, and to uh, outside of Cairo to look at the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. And then took a plane up the Nile River to the ruins of Thebes and walked through the temple of Ammon at Amon Ra that was built in 3700 BC, the greatest temple that was ever built in the world. And I saw all these great things. And uh, we know that black people built all these things. And yet, Pine uh, B was supposed to be the greatest historian of his day a professor at Oxford University, and he tells you that these people were white. And if you listen to these people, you'll get your uh, mind terribly balled up. Down in, uh, in Kenya, outside of Nairobi, I visited a village of people that they uh, called the Maasai's. The Messiahs of the same racial stock as the ancient Egyptians and the Ethiopians. And uh, while I'm uh, uh, standing there looking the village over, some of these people came up and 
I was shocked. All the authorities that, can, that I have consulted told me that these people were members of the white race. And they were blue black. <laughs> In Senegal, where they say the people are Negroes, most of them were sort of medium brown color. None of them were actually black, but they are Negroes. And then you go over to East Africa among the Messiahs, and most of them are blacker than a blackboard, and they're white people. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're going to uh, 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 get the lowdown on history, you've got to use your own head, not somebody else's. Now, I found out that uh, the Greeks, who were supposed to have been the founders of civilization because they were the first civilized white folks, but the Greeks got their civilization from the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were black people. And the Greeks passed their civilization on to the Romans, and the Romans are a very stupid, dumb bunch of people for the most part. They couldn't retain it. They lost it. They had a dark age in, in, in Europe for 500 years. And then another bunch of Africans, the Moors, from North Africa moved into Spain and started civilization all over again. So instead of Europe civilizing Africa, Africa has civilized Europe two times. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what you have to uh, keep in mind. And uh, now I want to say something about uh, what, why it is that uh, I have to be teaching you be talking to you about African history, the reason I'm talking to you uh, about it is because it's not in the textbooks. And it's not in the textbooks because we don't write textbooks. We have other people write the textbooks and they put that propaganda in there and we are supposed to swallow it. Now we are told that after the Greeks uh, uh, were taken over by the Romans and that civilization decayed. And then the Roman civilization went down after the fall of Rome and you had a 500 year dark age. We were told that, uh, Christianity re-civilized Europe and, uh, produced modern civilization. And we know if we read the literature that these Christian, these white Christians of Europe are the dumbest people that ever lived. They said that the earth was flat like a pancake out in the uh, vastness of space with the sun and the moon and all the stars going around it. The ancient Egyptians in the pyramid age 6,000 years ago knew that the world was round. They knew that it went around the sun in 365 and one fourth days. And their astronomers measured the earth and they knew what the polar diameter was. They knew what the equatorial diameter was. They measured the circumference of the earth and they calculated it so accurately until modern astronomers said their error was only one yard. In other words, the circumference of the earth is about 25,000 miles and they calculated it with an error of about this, one yard. So uh, uh, if you read history the way it happened and not the way other people wrote about it, you will find out that the black race created the civilization, created the white, uh, civilized the white folks two times. Uh, so that uh, you want to get some perspective on this. And uh, the white folks took the religion of ancient Egypt, of Ethiopian Egypt, and... Uh, Balled it up completely. Right. They'll tell you that uh, uh, if you get some of this cheap literature like the Jehovah's Witnesses people turn out. <laughs> I remember seeing one of their quarters. God is sitting up on a golden throne in heaven. Blue eyes, blonde hair. Next to him is Jesus Christ, also with blue eyes and blonde hair. On the other side is the Holy Ghost, also white, and a bunch of angels in the background white, and a bunch of people kneeling on the ground, worshiping this God, black and white. Underneath his hell, 
with the devil black and all the imps black. So it looks as though uh, since white people are not admitted into the Christian heaven, then we all going to wind up in hell. But I told my students they had nothing to worry about because the only unpleasant thing about hell was the heat. It's too hot down there. <laughs> but since uh, if you go there, you're going to stay a long time. And if you stay long enough, you get used to the heat. <laughs> so that then it won't bother you anymore. <laughs> And then I found out that uh, the African, the Africans were dragged into the slave trade because the white folks were too lazy to work and produce the things that they wanted. And they brought, dragged us into slavery, converted us to their particular brand of Christianity. And the African had a much better religion over in Africa. That's what I call Christianity before Christ. He had a much better religion. The Christians tell you that there's a, a God sitting up on a throne in some place called heaven who created the whole universe and uh, he created the human race and they turned out to be such a uh, yeah, voiceless bunch of people and they had to have a flood drown out most of them to give the race a new start. And then this new bunch of people went to pot and finally had to send his only son down to be crucified to save these people. And uh, that's what they call the Christian scheme of salvation. Now the Africans uh, had a religion which was much better. Uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, if you will see a copy of my new book called Christianity Before Christ, and there's a long section in there on the mysteries of Egypt, those are the religious rites of the ancient Egyptians. And you will find out that uh, these uh, people, uh, in other words, there are two types of religion in the world, uh, supernatural religions or theistic religions, and then you have natural religions or atheistic religions. A lot of people have an idea that if a man is an atheist, that is if he doesn't believe in a personal God, He's an irreligious person. That's not true. The Africans had an atheistic type of religion, and they were deeply religious people because they uh, believed in that man not only has a body, but he also has a mind, soul, or spirit. Yeah. And they took the position, for instance, if you went to a temple in ancient Egypt and told the priest that you wanted Horus, the Egyptian Christ to save your soul, he would tell you to not to waste his time. That Horus, Osiris, Isis, and nobody else is going to save your soul except you. In other words, they tell, they tell you this. They say, we believe in reincarnation. You have lived before. You come back to the world. And if you want a better life, the next time you come back, you'll have to Earn it yourself. The gods are not going to give it to you. And the Egyptians told these people, if you want a better life the next time you come back to the earth, you live a good life now, and then when you come back, you'll have a better life. But if you lead an evil life, the next time you come back, it'll be worse. So it's up to you. And so that they, uh, they told people not to pray to gods or angels or anything to save them. It was their job to save themselves. And I think that's a better religion than asking some dead Jew to save you. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, these uh, people, they believed in spiritualism and they believed in theosophy. And uh, the whole world... All the religions of the world can be traced back to this African source. And uh, Christians say their religion is true, but paganism is false. And as I've told some preachers, Christianity was stolen from the pagans. So if Christianity, if paganism is false, so is Christianity. Now, uh, you say, you say to yourself, well, uh, yeah, when the uh, African a member of anyone who believes in the African traditional religion, he tells you that he will, he believes in God. 
But he doesn't believe in the type of God that the white folks believe in. The white folks believe that God is an oversized white man sitting on a throne somewhere up in a place called heaven. The African traditional religion teaches you that there's a number, there's a large number of gods. You have tree gods, sun gods, moon gods, earth gods, star gods, and all like that. And since a group of colleges make up a university, then a group of the little gods make up the big god. So you take all the little gods and merge them together and you get the great god, which is the universe itself. It never started, it never was created, and it'll never have an end. And uh, so therefore they said that the, uh, the great god is nature itself. The universe, and they believed in a doctrine of the Trinity. God is the physical universe. Christ is the mental universe. And matter and mind, and mind interact and produce life. So you get a Trinity of matter, life, and mind. And that's it. And uh, you, uh, to show you how, uh, how we have been Badly miseducated and, and misled. One of my friends is a great black scholar, Professor Yosef Ben Yakinen of Cornell University. You probably, some of you probably met Dr. Ben. Ben went into the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where they have a very fine Egyptian collection. And the young lady is sitting at the desk. Sir, what can I do for you? Dr. Ben says, I would like to visit the African collection. The young lady says, sir, we do not have an African collection. And Dr. Ben says, I meant to say the Egyptian collection. <laughs> oh, yes, we have an Egyptian collection. <laughs> but you know, the ancient Egyptians were not white people. Now, the ancient Egyptians, were, you know, yes, we have an Egyptian uh, collection. But the ancient Egyptians were not Africans. So Ben pulls the mat back out of his pocket, shoves it right in this girl's face. <laughs> Young lady, here's a map of Africa, and there's Egypt. Wouldn't you say that Egypt was in Africa? She said, I could say so. <laughs> ben says, do you say so? She said, no. <laughs> ben says, Young lady, you are a jackass. <laughs> The young lady became hysterical. She hollered for the manager. The manager came out and running and says, what's the trouble? Mr. Manager, this man just called me a jackass. <laughs> so the manager says, what's the problem? Ben told her the story that he was looking for the Egyptian collection. And this young lady said the Egyptians were not Africans. And he says, I have a map here. And here's Egypt. And Egypt is a part of Africa. Wouldn't you say so? The man says, well, you could say so. <laughs> Do you? No. Ben says, you also a jackass. <laughs> so he said, then he ducked out and uh, got out of the vicinity because he was afraid they're going to call the police and uh, put him in the jug for uh, disorderly conduct. So uh, this is the, the way we have been miseducated. Now, since Egypt was a great African culture, uh, we find out that uh, a few years ago, there were no black Egyptologists. Uh, we did have one recently, but he died at an untimely age, and that was Dr. Diop in Senegal. I visited him over in Africa and talked with him back in 1977, and Diop, besides being an Egyptologist, he was a lot of other things besides. So we had, and then we have a young lady who is an authority on uh, Egyptology. She's now doing, uh, working for the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago and doing uh, research in New York as uh, Mrs. Deidre Wimby. Uh, you might have uh, heard of her. She's a, a young lady that is going to be the first black woman Egyptologist. Now, uh, there was a brilliant scholar at Howard University a few years ago, Professor William Leo Hansberry. He graduated from Howard 
he went to Harvard University and was planning to work for a PhD in Egyptology under Professor George Reisner. He was one of the outstanding Egyptologists in this country. And uh, Reisner got up before the class and says, of course, you know that the ancient Egyptians were white people. And after he got through, Hansberry put up his hand. Well, Mr. Hansberry, what's your question? He says, I uh, want to challenge that statement you made about the ancient Egyptians being white people. He says, I've read his Herodotus history of Egypt. And he says the ancient Egyptians had black complexion and curly hair. He says, well, Mr. Hansberry, I don't accept Herodotus as an authority. So Hansberry tackled him. He says, listen, Professor, Herodotus visited Egypt in the 5th century B.C. and he saw these people. You didn't visit them and you didn't see them. (laughs) So Hansberry had him kicked out of his class. So here he was trying to get a Ph.D. in Egyptology. And the professor of Egyptology booted him out of the class. So he went to see the head of the Department of Anthropology, Professor Ernest Albert Hooten. And he says, Professor Hooten, what shall I do now? He says, well, Mr. Hansberry, he said, uh, if Reisner won't give you a Ph.D., you're not going to get it in this country. He says, I think you should go over to England and try to sign up in either Oxford or Cambridge. And he gave him some references. And he went over there and he told him that he wanted to get a Ph.D. in Egyptology. And the people in England were more honest. At both Cambridge and Oxford, they told him that they did not want any black Egyptologists, so they weren't going to give him a degree. <laughs> so uh, uh, Hansberry had to come back to the United States and get a job as a professor of history at Howard University. And then when he retired, he went to Nigeria and uh, was given a position as the director of the Hansberry Institute of African Studies, or some such title as that. And he was uh, running a school of African history in Africa, and he was writing a four-volume history of Africa. After finishing two volumes, he died. And the publishers couldn't find anybody else to finish the other two volumes, so they buried it. This is probably the greatest history of Africa that's ever been written, and the publishers have decided not to publish it. So uh, uh, we are being crossed up at every turn. And uh, you find out that uh, to show you what a vicious breed of people these racists are, uh, in my book, Man, God, and Civilization, I quote a psychologist from the University of Chicago. This was back around 1909, a man named Professor R.M. Cattell. And in this book, he said that the whole Negro race should be painlessly exterminated because they were a menace to humanity. Uh, fortunately, uh, people didn't buy his argument. They didn't round up all the black people and have them exterminated for the benefit of humanity. But the way the world is going now, if we can't retake our fame, as the Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden said, if we can't, we were once on top. If we can't get on top again, they probably will exterminate us. And uh, people uh, tell me, well, how are we going to do it? Well, I'm a retired member of a union in New York City, District 65, UAW, AF of LCIO. And we say that if you have a problem, you have to solve it. Nobody else is going to do it for you. And our union, if we had a problem, we solved it. We went out on a strike and we were walking the picket line for weeks. And it looked as though we were going to lose. But we kept plugging along. We finally won the strike and there was a victory celebration. Our union had 50,000 members. And one of the members got up and said to the president, how, why did we win this strike? We had everything against us, and yet we won. 
How did it come about? And the president says we won because we couldn't afford to lose. So that's our position now. Uh, if we want to survive, we can't afford to lose. And it's going to be up to us to see to it that we do survive. Uh, about 50 years ago, they had a professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago, Professor Thomas V. Smith. And he had a class in philosophy one. And when he got a bunch of students together and gave the first lecture, he said, my dear students, before giving my first lecture, I want to tell you a little story because I think it'll help you out. He says, an old maid went to bed one night, went to sleep, and she dreamt that in the middle of the night she woke up and there was a handsome young man standing by her bed. And she looked up and she says, young man, what are you going to do to me? And the young man bowed politely and says, lady, that is up to you. This is your dream. <laughs> The, the message I tried to pass on to my students is that no matter how hopeless the situation is, we're going to continue to struggle. You might lose, but if you don't struggle, you're certainly not going to win. So that's the only thing to do. And uh, in the union, I found out how it was that people won. Uh, to show you how this, how this union worked, uh, there was an Orthodox Jew who owned a, a big company in New York. And the union couldn't come to an agreement with him. They put picket lines around this plant. And uh, he hired a bunch of gangsters to intimidate the union. One of the gangsters grabbed one of our members as he was going to join the picket line and stuck a knife in his back. The knife went right through his back into his heart and killed him almost instantly. The union president called a meeting of the members and he said, we don't know what hand wielded the knife that killed our brother, but we do know the man that hired the man that wielded the knife. He has killed one of our brothers. We are going to kill him. So when they got up, and one of the union members said, Mr. President, how are we going to do it? It's a, you go out and kill a man and you get convicted for murder. He said, we're going to kill him so that nobody can, can convict us. So they said, well, how do we do it? They said, well, Mr. So-and-so who hired the murderer that killed our brother, he is a member of a certain synagogue here. He says that when the synagogue services come along uh, on the Jewish Sabbath, we're going to pick pick pickets in front of the place and say, Rabbi, you have a murderer in your temple. Well, the rabbi comes out and finds that his temple is being picketed. And he asked them, who is the murderer? They told him. The man sitting in his congregation, he says, don't come back into this thing and settle. He says, I don't want a murderer in my congregation. And he picket lines around, around my uh, synagogue. So he couldn't come to his synagogue anymore. So uh, he uh, went up to upstate New York and hired a cottage by a lake. The union went up there, rented boats, crossed the lake, and picketed this cottage. <laughs> you have murdered one of my our brothers, and uh, you will pay for it. So that <laughs> depressed him so until he moved back to New York City and got himself a fine home. And then the union set up a committee to telephone him all through the night hours of the, uh, all the hours of the night. So that this guy, after he moved into his New York home, the telephone rang all night long and he never got any sleep. Well, you know what happens if you put for a long period of time if you don't sleep. Here was a young man, not quite 29 years old, and we harassed him so until he dropped dead of a heart attack. We killed him, and yet the law couldn't touch us. I've heard, uh, I knew a preacher in New York that I admired greatly. 
our elder S.J. Worrell. They call him Steamboat Bill because in his younger days, he'd been a buck and wing dancer on the shore boat in the Mississippi River. When he retired, he, be he became an evangelist. He started a church in Harlem and he got up on street corners and taught the people the kind of religion they should be getting. They weren't getting it in the regular churches because all the regular churches had turned into rackets. But Steamboat Bill, Bill was giving them the true gospel. I attended one of his meetings and in order to get a crowd, he set up a stepladder and he would tap dance up and down the stepladder and then spin around on his heels on top and then tap, uh, tap dance back, back and the people would come to see him dance. And then after he got through, he would preach his sermon. So Steamboat Bill would say, brothers and sisters, he says, the other preachers around here are trying to sell you pie in the sky. He says, that's not more my program. I'm trying to get you a better lifestyle in this world. He says, and we'll deal with the next world when we come to it. He says, now, uh, you've been badly misinformed. He says, I know a man that lives in an apartment right across the street, and he's afraid to come outside. He owes everybody. Six o'clock in the morning, somebody taps on the door, and he's afraid to answer. But a card comes under the door. Uh, he owns a secondhand car, and the uh, automobile man wants to go know when he's going to get the next installment. A few minutes more to the tap on the door. Uh, he owes somebody else for a radio set that he's bought on the installment plan. And this keeps on until about nine o'clock. There's a loud bang on the door. And he's afraid somebody's going to knock the door down. So he says, who is it? And the voice comes back, it's the Lord. And the man says, what Lord? The landlord. <laughs> Steamboat Bill says, that's the only Lord that most of you jokers are ever going to see. <laughs> so just about this time, the meeting got livened up. A drunk came by. He was a brother that had not one drink too many. He'd had a lot of drinks too many. And he's staggering around. He stops in front of Steamboat Bill's meeting. And he shook his fist at him. Oh, nigga, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Steamboat Bill says, listen, young man. If you want to stand here and listen to my uh, discourse, uh, you're welcome. But I do not permit you to disrupt my meeting. So the young man shook his fist again. Oh, nigga, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Steamboat says, listen, young man, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ says that you slapped me on one cheek. I'm supposed to let you slap me on the other. Well, I want you to know one thing. I ain't Jesus Christ. If you slap me on one side of my face, I'm coming down and bust hell out of you. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, unfortunately, Steamboat Bill died a year later. If it hadn't been for that, I was going to join his church. Because <laughs> here was a man that not only uh, had a church, but a depression was on. And he opened up a, a free lunch kitchen in his church. And the unemployed people could come around there and get free sandwiches, free coffee, free cake and all like that. And he went around and raised the money to finance this program. And he told the people, he says, it doesn't do me any good to save your soul if your body is hungry. So I've got to feed you first. Now, uh, all of that leads up to this, that uh, uh, if we are going to save ourselves, we're not going to have a, a lily white God and a Jim Crow Jesus save us. We've got to do the job ourselves. And this idea of uh, being submissive and meek and all like that is not going to get us anywhere. We can defend ourselves if we do it intelligently. You don't go out and attack the Sherman tank if all you had was a BB gun or a slingshot. There's another way you have to do it. When I was at Grand Central Station at the Red Cap, I met a young man there who uh, had been working on the job a number of years, and he had a special problem. 
He was sent down to the lower level of Grand Central Station, which is on 42nd Street in New York. And the vice president came in from the suburbs. And this red cap was detailed to carry his bags out to the street. And every time he went down there, the man insulted him. You know, stuff like, boy, pick up my bag. Nigga, get, get a, uh, a move on or something like that. And the young man knew if he gave him an argument, being the vice president of the railroad, he'd lose his job. He couldn't afford to lose his job. But he was determined that he was going to punish this man. So one day he went down to get the suitcase of the vice president, and he was the only person on the train. There was the entire lower level of Grand Central Station, and the vice president and the red cap, and nobody else in the vicinity. So this young man hauled off and hit this man in the jaw and broke his jaw. <laughs> Knocking completely unconscious and laying on the platform bleeding. Somebody later on come and found him, called an ambulance. They put him on a stretcher and carried him. To, I, I have water here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and they put him on a stretcher, took him to the hospital. Then when he got his jaw back together, he came back and swore out a warrant to... Uh, that this red cap committed assault and battery on him, broke his jaw, nearly killed him, and all the rest of it. So the red cap was hailed up before a judge. The vice president told him how this man beat hell out of him. And then the judge said to the red cap, did you commit assault and battery on this man? He said, no, I didn't. It must be a case of mistaken identity. I wasn't there. And then he said to the vice president, do you have any witnesses that saw this man beat you? He said, no. He says, case dismissed. This red cap broke his jaw, beat him down to death. And the judge threw out the case because there were no witnesses. So you, you don't have to be meek and submissive. You can get your point if you go, go about it in the intelligent way. <laughs> and... Uh, um, after that, the vice president was very nice to the red cap. He was afraid he might get his other jaw broken. So he kept his big mouth shut. I see I have a note here that uh, yeah, we're, going, we're going to have some discussion or questions or something like that. So I'll now stop. And the floor is open for, I think we'd better make it questions because discussions will take up too much time. So you ask me some questions, and I see, can't I give you the right answers? Okay. Okay, first of all, let's give Professor Jackson a hand for being here. Saying it's all right. Okay, those of you who have questions, I'd like you to come up if you're in the front to come to the forward mic or if you're in the back. Okay, uh, brother in the back first. Jack, uh, one question for you, uh, Jack, congratulations. Uh, you indicated that uh, earlier you had a grievance that you were going to get a white civilization. Uh, I was told that you know black cat with like curly hair and uh, dark thick skin. I've seen some Greeks. I also go back to the Hebrews, uh, the Jews, the original. I was told that the original Jews were also black and people coming from Ethiopia. About the Greeks, I think mean, that like, you know, black people a little bit on that. Oh yes, the the original Jews were black people. These white Jews that you see were European Jews that lived in the southern part of Russia. And they were converted by Jewish missionaries. So the original Jews were black, and the ones that have set up the state of Israel, they're not Jews at all. And uh, how they got away with this skullduggery, I don't know. <laughs> I knew a wealthy Jew in New York who owned a furniture polish factory. And you offer his name, Mark Jackson. Uh, born in Ireland, lived in London a number of years, and this company was called Jackson of London. 
And we were having dinner together one day. He says, Brother Jackson, he says, these Zionist Jews are giving me hell. I says, why? He says, well, I think Zionism is a racket, and they know I've got money, and I wouldn't contribute a dime to it. So they've got me in the doghouse. And he told me, he said, the proof that Zionism is a racket is that 50 years ago, or a little over 50 years ago, the Zionists could have bought all the land they wanted down in Brazil for almost nothing for acre, and they could have set up that Jewish state down there, and nobody would have bothered them. They went back to Palestine and set up that state in a land where the soil is so poor until you ain't quit even grow weeds on it. And if it went for the Amer rich Jews in America, Israel wouldn't even survive. And it's in very bad financial condition now. So that uh, uh, you have a situation like that. Now, the original Jews were black, and the Jews boast that they produced the greatest philosopher in the world, Spinoza, who lived in Holland in the 17th century. Spinoza was uh, of Spanish and Portuguese ancestry. I think his Portuguese ancestry. And one of his neighbors described him as a man with a black complexion and curly hair. So the great Jewish philosopher was a black Jew. Okay. What? The early Greeks, the ancient. Oh, they, they had a strong mixture of African blood. Everybody did, because since the human race came from Africa, uh, according to law in this country, if you have just a small amount of African blood, that makes you a Negro. Well, if you take that literally, then this even Reagan is a Negro, because if you trace his ancestry back far enough, you go to Africa. So he had, even Reagan has African blood. <laughs> Uh, that, that, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for uh, being here as sort of one of our elder statesmen and elder scholars, and thank you for coming to Lausanne and sharing your time and energy with us. The question I have for you is, uh, something that struck me in your introductory comments when you say that people like Arthur Schomburg and Jay Rogers and uh, people like that were your mentor. Yeah, sure. and I'm wondering, uh, through the 60 some odd years of your career as a scholar, what has been the most encouraging development in terms of black becoming more in tune with our Well, the most encouraging development I had was when I stood on steep street corners at night in Harlem and heard Dr. Hubert H. Harrison lecture. And then I would sometimes go to the YMCA, he'd be lecturing there, and sometimes to the library, and sometimes he stood on the steps of the sub-treasury on Wall Street, right opposite J.P. Morgan's office. Morgan was probably at the window listening to him. And Harrison gave a lecture down there on Wall Street one day, and the police had to rope off the street because he was lecturing to an audience of 11,000 people. Now, here was an unusual black man who fought for the freedom of everybody. He uh, left the Socialist Party because the white socialists were racist. He joined the Garvey movement because he said that the socialists said class first and they practiced race first. And Garvey advocated race first and that's what he believed in. So he, uh, he said, uh, I don't believe in class first, I believe in race first. So he joined the Garvey movement. And uh, Harrison was a man, he didn't get into history because he didn't allow white people to flatter him. You have a lot of our people, if a big white man gets up and says some nice words about him, they're tickled to death. <laughs> so Harrison went to a white YMCA in Brooklyn, New York, and the secretary got up and said, Dr. Harrison is a great scholar. He has a black face, but his heart is white. So Harrison banged his fist on the, on the rostrum, 
Sir, I demand a retraction. I'll have you understand that my heart is just as black as my face. And Harrison, uh, to show you the, uh, what a great education he was, he would be lecturing in a library in Harlem on 135th Street. And half of the audience would be students from Columbia University taking notes because they were getting more from Harrison than they were from the professors up at the, at the university. So Harrison gave a lecture, uh, I think it was at a library, either the library or the YMCA one night. I wasn't there, but some of the people who heard the thing told me the story. Harrison was giving one of his scholarly lectures and a uh, young man was sitting in the audience and when he got through, he asked, Harrison, a silly question, and Harrison gave him a silly answer. The young man got lost his temper. Now, see here, Dr. Harrison, you are not talking to a fool. I am a highly educated young man. I finished Harvard last year. Harrison says, I beg to differ, young man. You did not finish Harvard because Harvard is still there. <laughs> he says, uh, yeah, you didn't say what you meant to say. You told us tonight that you finished Harvard on commencement day. He says, now the day you finish school is called commencement day. Are you trying to tell us that you finished on commencement day? Well, of course, the young man blew his top and walked out of the meeting. He wasn't going to stand for that sort of thing. So another night, he was on a street corner on 7th Avenue. I think it was 7th Avenue and 135th Street. And a young white man walked into the meeting. Harrison would generally have anywhere from 100 to 300 people standing around while he talked. This white man comes in, and Harrison was lecturing on evolution. And he was telling about how the human race evolved from apes in Africa more than a million years ago. Therefore, we are the original race. And this white man waited for the question period. Dr. Harrison, you say that the first men were black and they evolved from apes in Africa. Is that the reason why black people look more like apes than white people do? Harrison says, you've got it entirely wrong, young man. White people look much more like apes than we do. He says, and I'm not asking you to go to a, to a, a library and do research. All I want you to do is to use your eyes. Go to a zoo and go to the cages where they have the apes. He says, and you won't find one black ape there. All the apes have fair complexions. They have thin lips. They have Anglo-Saxon noses, and they have straight hair. So if you want to get somebody that looks like an ape, get a white man. I have another question. Because apparently when you speak to Earth moves. <laughs> the question I have for you is, uh, do you have any ideas on approaches uh, that the rest of African people need to take in order to get our youth uh, more interested in their history. Because as you said, if our people don't read anymore, and if our people are not reading and not getting information that gives them a sense of value of who they are, I'd just like to know what your uh, opinion on that subject would be. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because there's one, only one way they can do it, and if they do and do it, we're not going to be around very long. In other words, any group of people, if they're going to survive, they have to have an economic foundation. There's a block in Chicago where there are seven storefront churches on one side of the street and eight storefront churches on the other side of the street. And if you go into the average black neighborhood in a big city, you will see a storefront church, a saloon, a liquor store, a gambling joint, no business enterprise is bringing any money into the community. Now, the only way we're going to beat this is to get the young people to organize into cooperative societies. If you need a million dollars to go into business, get 
trying to get together a large number of people and each one of them puts up a few dollars and you put it all together and you've got enough money to go into business. I'm a member of a cooperated food market in Chicago. We have 11,000 members. Each member owns at least one share in the business. That's $10. We have a credit union, our own bank. Some of the people have thousands of dollars invested in the business and it pays 6% interest. So that's just as good as putting it in the bank. Now here's 11,000 people. They and their families buy their groceries at the store. It's a big building, takes up nearly a whole block, like an old fashioned railroad station. We draw interest on our shares. We get good food at a reasonable price and we give a lot of jobs to young people. Now, if you want to survive, you form cooperative societies, pool together whatever your money you can get, go into business for yourself, and then see to it that you educate yourself. Uh, and that means you've got to learn to read. You're not, uh, you're not going to get it on television and radio. Uh, I remember Hubert Harrison uh, gave a lecture to young people. And he says, I advise all young people who can afford it to go to college. He says, I know a college education is expensive and some of you won't afford, can't afford to go to college. But if you can't go to college, get knowledge anyway. You say you can study in libraries, you can buy books, you can teach yourself. And he says that a reading people is a rising people. If you read enough, you will rise, but you've got to have an economic foundation. And the only way you're going to do it, you talk about young people being unemployed. Nobody's going to give them jobs. They've got to set up their own businesses and create their own jobs. And if we don't do that, there may not be any of us around when the next century starts. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the African's contribution to Christianity, please? Oh, yes. The Africans created Christianity. If you will read, I have a little, uh, uh, a little uh, article here that I copied from uh, a book by Dr. Albert Churchward called uh, Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man. It's an article on Horus and Jesus. Horus was the black Christ of ancient Egypt. And Jesus was the black Christ of the Christians. Now the Christians have been so badly educated until they think that Jesus Christ was white. But if he was born in the vicinity of Nazareth or Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he could not have been white because white people didn't live in that territory. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what Dr. Church Ward says about comparing the life of Horus as recorded in the Book of, Dead, of the Dead of Ancient Egypt and the life of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament. Horus had two mothers, Isis the Virgin who conceived him and Nephthys who nursed him. He was brought forth singly as one of five brothers. Jesus had two mothers, Mary the virgin who conceived him and Mary the wife of Cleophas who brought him forth as one of her children. He was brought forth singly as one of five brethren. Horus was the son of Seb, his father on earth. Jesus was the son of Joseph, his father on earth. Horus was with his mother the virgin until 12 years old, when he was transformed into the beloved son of God as the only begotten of the father in heaven. Jesus remained with his mother, the virgin, up to the age of 12 years when he left her to be about his father's business. From 12 to 30 years of age, there's no record in the life of Horus. From 12 to 30 years of age, there's no record in the life of Jesus. Now, why is it that in the, in the story of the Egyptian Christ, there's a gap of 18 years, and in the story of the Christian Christ, there's also a gap of 18 years? I'm coming back to that. 
Horus, at 30 years of age, became adult in his baptism by Anu. Jesus, at 30 years of age, was made of a man of in his baptism by John the Baptist. Horus, in his baptism, made his transformation into the beloved son and only begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit, represented by a bird. Jesus, in his baptism, is hailed from heaven as the beloved son and only begotten of the Father God, the Holy Spirit, that is represented by a dove. Now, you have two stories, one known in Egypt 10,000 years ago, and the other one supposed to have happened 2,000 years ago. One is 8,000 years older than the other. The Egyptian account is 8,000 years older. It must have come first. So, the, <laughs> so it must have been the black people that had the true doctrine and the white people copied it and they made a great error. The Egyptians say that there's nothing, there's a blank in the life of Horus between the age of 12 and the age of 30. The story of Jesus, there's nothing about his life between the age of 12 and the age of 30. The Christians can't explain it. Why do you have this 18 year blank? The Egyptians explained it. They said there were two Horuses, Horus the child and Horus the adult. Uh, childhood ends at the 12th year. So that the history of Horus the child ends at the 12th year. Horus the man, since uh, adulthood didn't begin in Egypt until the age of 30. Then the story of the man begins at the age of 30. So you have Horus the child, Horus the man. And since childhood ends at the 12th year and adultship doesn't begin until the 30th, you have this 18 year gap. So if you want to understand Christianity, don't uh, go to the King James Bible. Go back to Egypt and Ethiopia where it came from. In other words, don't let other people uh, tell you what is and what isn't. If Dr. Edward Byer, Wilmot Blyden, the great Pan-African, said to the young people of his day, you once ruled the world. Now it is time to retake your fame. Uh, this seems like thousands of years, but the, the one ethnic group that doesn't seem to be able to do this is the Igbo. They seem to be sort of put in this one small area of Nigeria. They can't find a, 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 a area that's close by that has a, a similar uh, language to them. So they're wondering, you know, where they actually came from. and. Uh, uh, can you uh, elaborate on that particular? Well, I don't think I can give you an answer there. The only thing I can say is that these Igbos, these Igbos must have come in later on, and they were not a part of the original people that uh, occupied this territory, because there was a famous German anthropologist named uh, Frobenius. He wrote a two-volume work on Africa called the, uh, the Voice of Africa, published in 1912. And he said there was a brilliant civilization in West Africa thousands of years ago on the west coast of Africa, the, the civilization of Atlantis, not an island. It was an African civilization, and they called it Atlantis because it was on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. And these uh, people not only had a great civilization of their own, but they sent colonists to the New World, and these Africans brought civilization from Africa over to the Americas. Uh, if you want, you get want to get a good summary of that. Doctor Ivan Van Sertima has a book called "They Came Before Columbus." You can you can get the story there. Uh, but uh, uh, in, if we uh, study history as it is, we will find out that we have a great history. But we have allowed our enemies to take our history away from us. And we have to teach the young people that we have a history and we are going to reclaim it. But we not only need history, 
If we were to survive in the modern world, you've got to get wealth and power. And I suggest that since we want to survive, then we had better get wealth and power. about uh, the work of Gerald Massey and Albert Kirchberg. These are two profound scholars you quote quite frequently in your works. Could you say a little bit more about them and their contribution to our understanding of African history? Well, I, uh, I, what I have to uh, I have to talk about Massey first, because Dr. Churchward was one of his disciples. General Massey was born in the, one of the country districts of England in 1828. His parents were so poor until they couldn't give him any education. So in his, all of his lifetime, and Massey died in 1907 at the age of 79, and he never had more than one year of formal education in his whole life. And yet he became one of the greatest Egyptologists of his day. It shows you that if you have intelligence and ambition, no matter how hard the road is, you can win. And Massey did this. He was working in a in a mill in the, in the, near where he was born, and the mill caught on fire and was burned down. So Massey found himself. I think he was about ten years old at that time. A boy ten years old that had to go out and work for a living because his parents were too poor to take care of him. The mill burned down. He had no job, so he managed to get to London. And he got a job there as uh, working as a haberdashery clerk. And he worked all day and he went to bookstores and bought books and he sat up and read every night. He found that he could write. He had a talent for writing poetry. He wrote poetry and became known as an outstanding poet. He studied the works of Shakespeare and became an authority on the works of Shakespeare. And then he got interested in the history of Egypt. And he went to the British Museum as a young man. And the head Egyptologist at the uh, British Museum at that time was Dr. Samuel Birch. And he went in and said, Dr. Birch, I wish to become an Egyptologist. I know that I will have to know how to read the hieroglyphics. I want you to help me teach myself to read the hieroglyphics. Dr. Birch says, Mr. Massey, I will do all I can for you. So under the guidance of Dr. Samuel Birch, Massey consulted the, the hieroglyphic and the hierotic texts in the British Museum. I was over there in 1977 and they have the finest Egyptian collection in the world. And Massey was, uh, went behind the scenes and saw these original manuscripts that had been uh, published in Egypt thousands of years ago. And he sat down and learned how to translate this dead language into English. And then he said that the main thing for me to do is to explain the mythology and the, and the religion of ancient Egypt. So he wrote six volumes. In 1881, he wrote a two-volume work called A Book of the beginnings. And he said the purpose of this book is to show that all history and all knowledge comes from Africa. Then he followed it up with another two volumes in 1883 called The Natural Genesis. And then in the year of his death, 1907, he got out a new, he got out a last two volume edition, his greatest work called Ancient Egypt, The Light of the world. And Massey in these books shows that the human race originated in Africa. Civilization originated in Africa. Religion originated in Africa. Science came from Africa. Mathematics came from Africa. And that is our African heritage. And if we uh, uh, inspired by Massey, then we're going to have to fight to reclaim it and preserve it. Now, uh, there was another young man who was one of his associates when he was doing his research at the British Museum, an anthropologist named Dr. Albert Churchward. 
Church one was a 32nd degree, or no, a 30th, 30th degree mason and a famous surgeon and a famous physician. He was a member of the Royal Council of Physicians and the Royal Council of Surgeons. And that means if you get on that uh, uh, council, you have to be a top man. Because if the king or queen gets ill, a member of the Royal Council of Physicians or the Royal Council of Surgeons is sent in to take care of their health. So if the ruler got sick, they would call, if, if no other surgeon or physician was available, they would call in Dr. Churchward. And to show you how great these men were, Churchward uh, studied under Massey for 20 years, and after Massey died in 1907, Churchward took up his work and continued it. He wrote The Origin and Evolution of the Human Race in 1921, The Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man, uh, back about uh, 1913. Uh, the Origin and Evolution of Religion in 1924, and The Origin and Evolution of Freemasonry. Now, to show you what great men uh, Massey and Churchward were, there was a famous English novelist, a woman named Mary Ann Evans. She wrote under the pen name of George Eliot, and she wrote a novel called Felix Holt, The Radical. And Massey was the model for Felix Holt. In other words, Massey has been immortalized in the, the literature of the world by this novel that was written by George Eliot. And later on, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was one of the greatest literary men of the modern times, he wrote a book called The Lost World about a great explorer that went into the wilderness of South America and and discovered some of these ancient animals that were supposed to have died millions of years ago, still living. And he called this character Professor George Edward Challenger. His model was Dr. Albert Churchward. So here were two men that found that Africa had been left out of history, Gerald Massey and Albert Churchward, and they put Africa back in history and it's now up to us to keep it in. All right. Yeah, I just had one question uh, for you was about uh, the Hansbury, the two volumes you mentioned on African history. What I was curious about was the name of the publisher that you said. That Random House. Random House. And my second question was, um, could you maybe share with us what you think the research agenda should be for future African scholars, especially in regards to uh, things like the Aborigines of Australia, the Middle East, and the South Pacific, or the diaspora? Well, they should read the works of people like Church Ward and Massey, and they should always also read the works of Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden, especially Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. I was talking to uh, the proprietor of the Marcus Bookstore yesterday. And he told me that he's going to reprint Dr. Blyden's great book on Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. And I would advise you when this book comes out to read it because Blyden states in there, our people once ruled the world. Uh, we lost it. And now it is time that we took it back again. We must regain our fame. So you'll have to study the way, in other words, you have to study the works of people who uh, have, are helping us to pre preserve our African heritage. And uh, yeah, among the people, you should read the works of uh, men like Ben Yakinen, Professor John Henry Clark, Dr. Blyden, and other people like that. Uh, you see, if people are going to survive, they've got to stick together. For instance, the people in Chicago recently elected Harold Washington for the second term as mayor of Chicago. And I was eating in a Greek restaurant. The proprietor is one of my students. He reads all of my books. And we sit down and discuss it. Here's a Greek that's interested in African history. 
So I'm sitting in there, and he's at another table talking to one of his friends. And they're telling him, why is it that the black people all came out and voted Harold Washington back into the office? And this uh, man says, they should do that. He says, I'm a Greek. And if a Greek candidate ran for mayor of Chicago, even if he was nothing but a greasy bum, I would vote for him because he's one of my people. And he said the black people should be congratulated because they were putting one of their own people in office. That's what every sensible man should do. Yeah. Dr. Jackson, I've been told that when the Caucasian first came with Africa, but they, they were not allowed into the central civilization because they were seen as barbaric and essentially being out of hell. First, I'd like to know, is this true? And if it's not true, what was the attitude for adopting the Caucasian second? Well, the, the Africans uh, didn't like these people because in the first place, they said that a healthy person had a dark complexion. If your complexion was that compared, black pale, you must be sick. <laughs> and another thing they said they didn't like about these people is that they, they had a bad smell about them. Uh, so, uh, and the Africans were very uh, intelligent. They said God was black and the devil was white. Well, I mean, it looks that way. <laughs> I, I was teaching at City College and my best students were members of the black nation headed by Elijah Mohammed. And uh, he said the black, the white devils will do anything. He was absolutely right. They will. But what we've got to do is to stop them from doing it. I you know, you hear about the mystery system and the process, the elaborate process and, and the priesthood. Can you talk a little bit about the male female role? Uh, I tell you, I can't I don't have time to talk about it, but you'll find it in my books. Uh, all you've got to do is read Christianity Before Christ. It's on the table up there. And another one called The Golden Age of Africa, which is a chapter of a new book that I'm writing. And uh, yeah, uh, I think you, if you can't find it here, you can get it at the, at the Marcus bookstore. They don't have it. They'd order it for you. And my other books, Introduction to African Civilizations, Man, God, and Civilization. And in Christianity Before Christ, I have a long dissertation on the mysteries of ancient Egypt. And there's a little pamphlet they have on there on the mysteries of Egypt. So if you will take, if you can get a copy of the pamphlet and read it, that will give you an answer. Sort of my question too, but I want to ask Dr. Jackson. I hear a lot about the mystery of in Egypt. Were there other, any mystery systems throughout Africa? They had them all over the world, but the, the, uh, the mother school that was the foundation of all was in Thebes in ancient Egypt. And then they had them at Heliopolis in Memphis. Uh, in Greece, they had them, uh, 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 the Elysian mysteries and uh, uh, the mysteries at Dodona and other places like that. And uh, they, uh, they had a, 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 a mystery cult in Greece at a place called Dodona. And Apollo, the god of this particular mystery, had African features. So that shows that it came from Africa. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Two-part question. Uh, you came along at a time when there was much less information available to you than there is to us now. Uh, I would like to know what told you, or when did you realize that something is very, very wrong with the way black people are educated? And also, when my child asked me, "Mommy, if we were so great, what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what can what?" I mean, I know partially what happened, but I want to know as much as I can. Well, I'll give you an answer. I told this to my students, and they told me they didn't believe me. They said, how is it that we, who once upon a time ruled the world and were the most civilized people in the world, how was it that these white savages whom we civilized turned around and took us into slavery and brought us over here and have us wait for hundreds of years building up the country? How did they do it? I say the way they did it is because they were a bunch of thieves, uh, cutthroats, 
and low down characters and the Africans were humanitarians. I said the Africans welcomed these people into their countries and they, they came in with a Bible and when they came in, the Africans had the land and the white folks had the Bible and later on, the Africans had the Bible and the white folks had all of the land. So I said, the reason why we got sidetracked is because the European people were vicious, brutal type of people, and we were a race of ladies and gentlemen. And if you have a confrontation between an honest man and a crook, the crook generally wins. We went down, but there's no reason why we should stay down. It's time that we got up. Okay. Uh, I, I like to address the getting up part. <laughs> um, right now, we live in Oakland, and I see a unusual phenomenon of Asian business moving into the black community, and especially male businesses and black women patronizing these businesses. And these things were never buy from black people. And the first part of my question is what can we do since we don't have black people read? Who will read if I pass out a leaflet to them? What can we do to turn them around and understand that we we have black women here and black men who do nail and black people who have businesses to get them to buy from black people? Well, what we'll have to do is to get trained young people to set up cooperative businesses where they can create their own jobs and build up their own wealth. Uh, the white people in Europe. In England, a little town called Rochdale, in 1844, a bunch of poor weavers who were unemployed raised a capital of $70 and went into business for themselves. They called it the Rochdale Cooperative Society. This, this cooperative society started with a small group of people with $70 capital and by the year 1928, the cooperative movement in England had grown to the place where they owned railroads, department stores, fishing boats, all sorts of banks, insurance companies, and they had a capital of $1 billion. So we will have to go into the cooperative business, businesses, patronize our own, uh, uh, control our own businesses, uh, build up our own finances, and that will save us. In other words, you can't do anything until you have an economic foundation. And if you build up your own uh, institutions, these foreigners can't come in and take over because you're not going to let them. You see, one of the things that we have is that a lot of our people are bought off. I attended a meeting in East Harlem in, uh, in New York back about 1970. Uh, Six, and a disciple of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked me to join in with his organization to drive the white devils out of East Harlem. It's our neighborhood. We're going to set up our own industries, our own stores, or anything like this. Why should these people come in and take all the money out of the community? We're going to manage our own affairs. Are you with us? I says, I am. So I said to myself, well, I uh, hope Hannibal gets his crowd together. I says, we might start a riot that will make the front front page and I might get killed. But I'm going to join in. I waited for a year. Nothing happened. The city went bankrupt and I lost my job teaching at the city college. I was I, I took a trip to Africa. And on the way back, I was talking to a delegation from Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. And they said, uh, you don't have a job in New York? I said, no. They said, as soon as you get home, start packing and come out to Chicago. We will make you a visiting professor at Northeastern Illinois University. So as soon as I got to New York, I packed up and came to Chicago. And I'm still living there. I taught three years in Northeastern. And uh, yeah, those are the things you, you've got to you've got to have knowledge, wealth, 
power and you've got to have ambition. Because uh, yeah, if you don't, if you, in other words, the main reason why our people let foreigners come in and take them over is because they hate themselves. Yes. Right. 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 I was walking along Lennox, I was walking along 7th Avenue in Harlem during the 30s and a sorry looking hungry young man, raggedy, was standing on a stepladder and here's his message. I'm hungry. I'm broke. I ain't got no job, and I don't see no job in sight. I hate myself. Well, you're not going to get anywhere that way. You've got to love yourself. I, I hear some of the preachers tell us we should love our enemies. That's not the answer. <laughs> We've got to love ourselves. And there are millions of us in this country. And if we are going to survive, we have got to save ourselves. As I told my students, your job is not to save the nation or the world or the race. Your job is to save you. You save yourself. And then you can give a helping hand to a more, to a less fortunate brother or sister. But if they are down in the gutter, uh, uh, helpless, you're not going to solve anything by getting down there with them. You've got to establish yourself first, and then you can pull them up out of the gutter. That's the only way we're going to make it. And Hubert Harrison had a slogan on that. He said, the reason why we are in such a bad fix is that most of us have wishbones where our backbones ought to be. <laughs> I have one other question. Um, Dr. Jackson, I have a question for you and a question for the audience. Um, you do, do you believe in pushing African studies in the public schools? I think African studies should be in all schools. I have a question for the audience. Last two weeks ago, August, I mean, this coming, and in this coming June 3rd, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley School Board had a meeting, and very few black people came out. And this meeting was for African studies in the public schools. They have the only African studies program in the country in a public school. Now, they're going to come back down here this coming June 30th, this coming Wednesday night. And I was wondering where y'all going to be on this, this coming Wednesday night, June 30th. I mean, do you believe in black folk? It's going to be at the Berkeley, uh, over by the Berkeley Unified District uh, that's down here at Center and Shattuck. And uh, the folks are telling us, uh, well, uh, uh, we gave you. This is that we should be satisfied. And I'm wondering, are black people satisfied with what our children are learning? No. Well, uh, if y'all can, we good to see as many people as see his night down there raising sand. But also, uh, I think there's another part to it. When we see Jewish folks do their children, every day after they come home from school, they have one hour of school in their history. And uh, if we don't initiate that, we're going to lose our children. I'm serious. Because if you give somebody your children eight hours a day and they don't teach you nothing when they come home, we in serious trouble. That's all I got to say. What's our name? Well, young lady. <laughs> uh, you asked the audience to answer. I think these people are, uh, agree with you, so I hope they will turn out at this meeting. But uh, here's what I find out that our trouble is, is that we are always expecting somebody else to solve our problems. And I told my students, don't expect the good white folks to solve our, our problems because they've got to the place now where they can't solve their own problems. So how are they going to solve ours? And here's the, uh, what I uh, find out. Uh, when I was teaching at City College in New York, 
The union, the member of, a, of the union that I was a member of, District 65, UAWA of LCIO, they asked me to come down and address, uh, give a lecture, a memorial lecture for Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It was King's birthday, and I was to come and give a lecture telling of all the great work that Dr. King gave. The union had a membership of 50,000 members, 75% of them black, and the audience was 90% white. And when I confronted some of the black brothers and sisters and asked them why they boycotted the meeting, they said, well, Dr. King is dead now. He can't do nothing for us now. So, I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, there was a great white man in this country who was our friend. And if we took his advice, we would have some of our problems solved already. The black Republicans of New York City had an emancipation celebration, emancipation day celebration at Cooper Union Hall in New York City in 1893. And there were three great orators, the Honorable Chauncey M. Depew, who was a big shot in the Republican Party, the Honorable Frederick Douglass, who was the wheel horse of the Republican Party, and Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll, who was the greatest orator in the world. And Ingersoll got up before this audience, and he says, I consider it a great privilege to talk to a great race of people. He says, you black people may not realize it, but you are a great race people. You raise the best of everything in this country. You raise the best cotton, the best corn, the best hogs, the best of everything. But you will never become first class American citizens until you go out and raise hell. <laughs> I just uh, I'd like to mention that Professor Jackson last Friday spoke at Berkeley High School, so he did show his support to the Black Studies program there. So let's Yes, sir. I would just uh, like to ask you real quickly the relationship of Islam to African history, African science, African religion, also the difference between religion and culture, and how did you yourself realize that you had made the mistake that more or less directed your life in the right course? Thank you. Well, I, I don't think I can answer all of your questions because I don't have time. But Islam, like every other religion, came from Africa because the human race came from Africa, and there's only one religion, but they have it under various different names. But the Africans knew what it was, and these other people got the message secondhand, and they've, they've never been able to figure it out. That's the reason why their minds are all balled up. Uh, now, uh, I can't answer all those questions because I, I, I don't have the, the time. But uh, uh, I think the thing for us to do is to take the advice of Dr. Blyden. We were once a great people, so now we have to retake our fame. And that means that we have got to educate ourselves. We've got to educate our children. And if we don't do that, we're not going to survive. And if we don't survive, then we don't have any problems. <laughs> you know, uh, only people that are living have problems. If you're dead, your problem's all solved. <laughs> I remember being in the union hiring hall looking for a job one day, and a bunch of uh, young people came in, probably been drinking a little bit, and they said to each other, well, we ain't got no jobs, but at least we ain't dead. So the dispatcher was standing there. He was announcing the jobs that he wanted to send members out on. And the dispatcher said, do you realize how silly you people are? He says, you were saying that although you ain't got no job, at least you ain't dead. He says, you'd be better off dead. 
He says, of course, if you are unemployed, you've got a lot of problems. If you're dead, you don't have any. So uh, being unemployed is much worse than being dead. So you better scramble around and get yourself a job. Okay, last question. Uh, Dr. Jackson, thank you for having me here. I'm not sure how it is in Chicago right now, but uh, I heard you speaking a few moments ago about uh, youth and cooperative economic effort. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I've heard a whole lot of talk for a number of years around it. A lot of things have happened around here in the last couple of decades. And I've heard a lot of talk about reason black people and economic effort. Uh, we have a successful uh, uh, youth cooperative here. Uh, unfortunately, they are about the commercial. They sell a lot of rocks. But nonetheless, we do have a highly sophisticated uh, percentage of you. Admittedly, only 5% of them survive, but uh, that was true.